It's Sunday, January 7, 2024. Happy New Year. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is a medical doctor, forensic psychiatrist and a world expert on violence who has taught at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Law School for 17 years before transferring her activities to Columbia and Harvard. She became known to the public by leading a group of mental health professional colleagues in breaking the silence about the immediate past U.S. president's dangerous psychology and publishing the New York Times bestseller, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. Dr. Bandy Lee, welcome back to The Weekend Show. Thank you very much for having me back. So uh, it is a, a timely moment for us to meet. This is the third time that you and I have had a conversation. As yesterday was the anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, the, the riot at the U.S. Capitol, the fake electors scheme, everything that Donald Trump and his people did to try and reverse the, uh, the conclusion of the, of the 2020 election, uh, unsuccessfully, I, I might add. But the perpetrator is still at large. And he's running for office. He's scheduled to stand trial in March, uh, you know, in, in this case for conspiring to overturn the election. But it looks like, you know, he's probably, with all the appeals that are going on, he's probably going to push that back and is very likely going to be on the ballot again for 2024. How does that make you feel <laughs> with everything that you've been through? seeing that this guy with this, with this malignant narcissism and all of the issues that you have highlighted and written about, how does it make you feel to know that he is very likely going to be on the ballot and the senior Republican candidate for President of the United States? Well, he is precisely the reason that I and a group of renowned colleagues came out in the very beginning in early 2017 to warn against the dangers he would pose to the American public. And um, so what's unfolding is not at all outside of our predictions, our fears, um, our trepidations. What is surprising is that there has not been an appropriate intervention. In fact, uh, there hasn't been, certainly hasn't been a psychiatric one since the American Psychiatric Association intervened and uh, simply tied our hands. There hasn't been a, a political one. Um, all the impeachments did not uh, succeed in turning around public opinion, which would have been the main purpose um, and still a possibility if they had consulted with us, we feel. Uh, and uh, nor were the indictments uh, carried out with the speed and vigor uh, to be effective. As a mental health professional and uh, a medical professional, what I look at is not so much uh, what would work legally or politically, but what would stop the spread of the dangers we were concerned about. And we have failed in just about every measure uh, despite given, being given multiple opportunities. I want to make it clear to people watching, especially Republicans or independent voters, that you're not highlighting this, and I'm not communicating and helping you to communicate this message because we are Democrats and we hate Trump and we hate the Republicans. And it, it's nothing to do with that, is it? I mean, just talk about for a moment the kind of the importance of this kind of non-partisan, non-political, but clinical diagnosis and why it's so important for American democracy for all parties going forward. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I am a forensic psychiatrist. I'm consulted regularly by the criminal courts, civil courts, international bodies and governments. Um, and the reason for this is because uh, medical professionals and experts bring a nonpartisan, non-political perspective. In fact, uh, we would be considered uh, one of the fact finders and, and uh, our opinion in a court of law is counted as uh, fact or as um, uh, 
an expert opinion as opposed to a, a simple opinion, meaning that uh, it's admissible as evidence. So um, just as uh, you cannot uh, bring psychiatric knowledge, in fact, the uh, American Psychiatric Association that spread the disinformation that we were uh, stating what we were for political reasons, um, using psychiatry as a political tool, uh, just as that is um, uh, not uh, ethical or allowed, um, it's also not advisable to politicize everything. Not everything is dependent on political opinion. Uh, so the more we make things partisan, uh, and politically motivated, uh, discounting any pos any other possibility, the more we become detached from facts and a common basis for uh, discussion, agreement, and uh, solutions. And this is a thing now, isn't it, to silence expertise. You know, ex experts were always people that were looked up to, that were held in high regard. And you know, I, I'm not an expert, probably on anything, right? Uh, but I, you know, I'm a communicator and, and, and journalistic, but I don't pretend to have expertise. You do not pretend, but you are qualified, as are your colleagues. And just talk to me about how it feels to be living in this kind of politicized society where expertise has been diminished by, by politics? Well, that is the danger because we have seen from the COVID pandemic that when we politicize medical knowledge and expertise and uh, simply state that anything goes in a public health crisis, uh, depending on one's political views, then we can, that translates into the difference between more than a million preventable American deaths versus no deaths. Uh, I, I sincerely believe that if we did not have Donald Trump in the presidency during the pandemic, that it may have stopped at an epidemic stage, that it would not have become the kind of international crisis that it had become. Uh, and worldwide, more than 7 million have died. So, uh, a difference between life and death is more a medical matter than a political matter. And we're seeing this lack of, or this dim diminishing of expertise in schools as well, with parents thinking that they know more than teachers and, and banning books because they think they understand curriculum better. And, and so it, it's kind of permeating everywhere, isn't it? Really taking people who are professional, and it's going to it's going to affect America's standing on the world stage if it hasn't already, right? Because you know, people around the world always looked up to the U.S. not just for its democracy, but also for its expertise, especially in medicine. And and the effect of Donald Trump and his surrogates is is now causing all of that to become diluted. Yes, in fact, we're not just concerned about our standing in the world anymore. Uh, that's certainly gone, um, at least in terms of authority uh, that we used to have. Uh, but we're now concerned about our the, the survival of our democracy, if not the nation itself, and even the survival of the human species. If you think about it, the ways in which Donald Trump has placed us in peril, not just by what he did as as um, as president with bringing the mental impairments that he had to the presidency, but also the the mental symptoms that he has spread, and uh, the difference between symptoms and or pathology versus healthy um, life affirming opinions, uh, whatever they, uh, whatever nature they take, the difference is that one causes destruction, is, is, is ultimately driven to destruction, and the other is, well, it, it supports life no matter what our um, disposition might be. Let's talk about the man himself, 
so sorry that you've had to spend the last decade of your life dealing with this with this creature. But how has his pathology changed since you initially rang the alarm about his his mental health? versus now because obviously he's got a little older he's been around for eight or ten years as a politician when he was running and then obviously in the role and it's almost like he just will not go away so what has what has changed in terms of your kind of clinical view of donald trump since he was president and now running again well uh his psychology has not changed and his mental unfitness has not changed. Uh, and he's doing exactly what we anticipated he would do in the absence of proper intervention, that he would grow worse, that he would continue to balloon in his uh, expectations, become more extreme in his expressions and continue to push boundaries. Uh, because that's um, containing himself is not something he can do on his own. Uh, and the most dangerous thing one can do is to, to hand someone like him power and, and to enable him. That is essentially what we have done. Um, and of course, there is certainly um, no end to this. Uh, I've dealt with such individuals my entire career, uh, and his pathology wasn't so much of surprise, but in fact, how we dealt with it as a society, that we could not dealt with it for what it was, that um, we couldn't even state that he had these mental impairments and severe symptoms that would grow with power and um morph into this grotesque uh, delusion of grandeur uh, and uh, increasing vindictiveness, because no matter how much you give him, how many privileges, how, ma how much power, uh, it will never satisfy the lack that he feels from early childhood. And, the, and so it will continue to uh, uh, swell in expectations and continue to be dissatisfied. Uh, and return back in vindictiveness, anger, rage, and revenge. And that is what he will unleash in society. And we're, we're beginning to see that as he's uh, expressing, using directly the terminology of uh, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels. Uh, we see this repetitive pattern. It's not so much that it's a playbook. As it is, it, it's perpetrator pathology. It's a kind of mental pathology that happens frequently in uh, violent individuals. And having treated violent offenders as a specialty in my 25-year career, I've seen at least a 1,000 such individuals. And they do not get better on their own. They will not curb themselves on their own. Uh, and this constant fear that we have had in intervening properly, holding him accountable and calling out things for what they are, uh, has, has greatly hampered, uh, our ability and, and to place the entire, uh, nation at stake to try to appease his pathological psychology is, is really a tragic condition in which we have been placed. Just explain to people who will criticize the fact that you've not been able to assess him in person. Just explain to people who might not understand how it is possible to an assess to assess an individual like Donald Trump without actually doing a clinical session with him. Yes, there is this uh, mistaken notion based largely on uh, pharmaceutical industry rhetoric, that psychiatrists are only to treat individuals in a closed private setting, uh, and uh, that the personal interview is the only way to uh, assess an individual, and medication is the only way to treat psychiatric conditions, and that what is untreatable by medication does not even exist. Um, 
that goes against every principle of psychiatry, which is actually biopsychosocial and uh, and ecological, increasingly so. Uh, and so to confine psychiatric principles to an individual is fallacy. Uh, I myself work in public health settings. I have worked with the World Health Organization for uh, close to two decades. And, um, and many times we intervene at the population level. Uh, the population level is much more effective for prevention uh, to treat individuals before they even get sick in the first place and to prevent vast amounts of suffering with very little effort or cost. So uh, to say that psychiatry only deals with individuals and only treats based on diagnoses is a fallacy. But first of all, dangerousness is not a diagnosis. It is a, an assessment of situation and it is more effectively assessed uh, at arm's length, uh, not engaging the individual directly. In fact, the most dangerous individuals are extremely beguiling and manipulative in ways that even mislead the, the most seasoned interviewer. So what we do is we looked at a, we look at objective evidence. We examine, um, uh, other people's, uh, interactions. We, uh, interview collaterals meaning coworkers, family members, uh, friends, and uh, acquaintances, we don't rely. In fact, the personal interview is the last thing we do and often is omitted in violence uh, risk assessments. And so, uh, so what the American Psychiatric Association, again, promulgated uh, essentially to protect its federal funding, which it did at, to unprecedented levels, because under the Trump administration, which rewarded scientific organizations only according to how much they were willing to go against science, the APA was one of the organizations that was handsomely rewarded. And uh, that will be a stain on the profession for ages to come. It is really beautiful to hear you as an expert speaking about something that political commentators have been just talking garbage about for, for so many years now, because it's so obvious to take someone like Donald Trump, and it's been proven in, in interviews where no interviewer has had any success in interviewing him because he is a gaslighter, a manipulator, and a liar. And so he will just reposition the question, not give a straight answer, say what he wants people to think. And I described him as a, as a constant stage manager in his mind. He's so visual. He's always stage managing everything, how he stands, how he looks, how he's perceived, the way he's lit, the way he sounds. He's constantly on the, on the go. Whereas Joe Biden, in contrast, doesn't do any of that stuff. And people fall for the fact that Trump must be more polished. But Biden is, of course, all about substance. Trump has none of that. And so it's so interesting to hear you say that clinicians wouldn't want to be in the same room as this guy. We should also consider the fact that he is the most photographed man on the planet in terms of video content, rallies. He loves, he's basically putting himself out there for people like yourself to analyze. Yes, my Harvard colleagues have consistently said that they know more about Donald Trump than any patient they've ever treated. <laughs> and that is <laughs> based on all the footage and uh, as well as incessant stream of consciousness uh, postings right. you know, on Twitter yeah. or Truth Social. Uh, we've never had this kind of unfettered access to what uh, a patient is thinking. Um, but I would also mention that... Um, Commentators, of course, have made uh, great effort, uh, but they were also placed in an impossible situation in that when we are dealing with a medical problem, and a psychiatric problem is a medical problem, when we are dealing with a, a, a condition of this level of severity, and there, I, I think most people can 
can assess without any expertise just how far gone he is compared to the average normal person uh, and how divergent he is, uh, that it does require expertise. And I think mostly in terms of, uh, of intervening uh, or managing behavior. And uh, that's essentially the main treatment modality you bring to such individuals. Uh, that has not been done so that the, he has not been able to be contained. Uh, in fact, all this should have been kept from the political arena in the first place. Uh, once it entered, in the very beginning, many people knew immediately that it was psychiatric. I, that's why I was invited to just about um, every network or cable news program at the time before the APA intervened. And uh, our book, the Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, which was specialized knowledge by psychiatrists and other mental health experts, uh, was uh, an instant New York Times bestseller. So much so that Macmillan, one of the big five publishers, ha ha took five weeks to replenish the stocks in a way that uh, would not run out immediately. Um, and it took three months for us to uh, be the number one topic of national conversation. That was an organic development. Uh, what happened afterward, uh, based on the APA's disinformation, by stating that we were acting as armchair psychiatrists, that we have no, we had no place in public discourse, that we were using psychiatry as a political tool and for self-aggrandizing reasons, all uh, actually um, were uh, notions that were promulgated by um, Jeffrey Lieberman, who is, uh, who is uh, a big time pharmaceutical psychiatrist. And uh, it wasn't even against the APA ethical guidelines. But what that did was it threw what should have been in the clinical realm into uh, the public realm uh, in a place where the public was unprepared couldn't have been prepared. And I'd warned multiple times that if we placed side by side a person with pathological symptoms, especially the kind that Donald Trump has, uh, it, it would never be a match for a rational person because mental symptoms spread much more rapidly than rational persuasion. Uh, lies travel more quickly than, than Back checks or 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 truth, and uh, delusions spread far more quickly even than lies. So how can you contend with that? How is it, therefore, that there hasn't been legislation passed to require psychiatric testing of presidential candidates? Because that would have nipped this in the bud in terms of his second run, wouldn't it? And all of them. I mean, I'm sure your your analysis of Vivek Ramaswamy would be fascinating to read because he's also an interesting character. But the, we all know that Trump is compromised. Even Republicans know that he's compromised. They're only sticking with him because he's popular and because, you know, he can ruin their careers. So there's there's emotional blackmail. There's There's political leverage there. But Surely a psychiatric test for all candidates, once they've won the primary, I presume, or maybe even before they win a, win a primary, should have been a legislation that was passed the day that Joe Biden got into office. Why do you think that they just won't go there with this stuff? Well, there is a lot that Joe Biden could have enacted immediately upon taking office, just as Donald Trump immediately uh, pathologized a lot of tools of government the moment he came into office. In fact, there was a dramatic shift and a dramatic departure from the way things were done in ways that were destructive and, in fact, from, from a psycholo psychological point of view, pathological. Uh, and, and Joe Biden could have reversed much of that by uh, declaring uh, what it was that he was dealing with. And uh, just as we have trouble uh, with naming 
criminality in pre past presidents. That's why Gerald Ford um, pardoned uh, Richard Nixon. We, ha we seem to have trouble uh, naming weaknesses in presidents, including mental pathology. And, um, and had Joe Biden taken the lesson from the Trump presidency to institute um, mental fitness exams for presidential candidates, even taken one of his own uh, to, to demonstrate as an example, that could have shifted things uh, a great deal. A president certainly does have that kind of authority, but he chose not to. Instead, he chose to reconcile with Republicans, uh, in spite of my saying even at that time that taking that stance would, uh, recon in other words, reconciling with the pathological and the criminal would give him neither reconciliation nor grounding in lawfulness or health. And uh, unfortunately, that is what, what has resulted. Very unfortunately, Joe Biden rather continued and um, carried out a lot of Donald Trump's policies that were based on pathology rather than on informed, rational decision making. And there is a difference. Uh, regardless, a lot of that around the border and immigration and that that type of stuff that that, that Trump or pulling out of Afghanistan based on a right. pact made with the Taliban yeah. or uh, going back on mask mandates uh, in the beginning he did very well in COVID control in the beginning but somehow felt that he needed to uh, calibrate back to Donald Trump's policy and that's why we continue to have this pandemic to this day. Uh, as well as, I believe, uh, the policies in Ukraine and in the Middle East. These are more Donald Trump conditioned policies, not, uh, not ones that are independent of him. Because as we know, in the federal government, it takes years for things to start and stop. And even the economy is an example. You know, we, we are, there is a delay often a delay of a, of a year or two at least for, for, for things to, to change. The, the solution would have been to say that there was a problem of mental health in the previous president and right. to consult with us and yes. to ask what kind of interventions would be necessary to reverse this very calamitous change that had occurred over the course of uh, his four years. But that, again, did not occur as it has not occurred in every other step where uh, consultation with us could have vastly improved the, the success of political measures. It's so weird, isn't it, that in every other industry outside of politics, that, you know, if there was an issue with mental health, it would be referred to clinicians. And yet, for some reason, in politics, due to populism, and everything else, they feel like the expertise is not necessary or they just want to brush it under the carpet and move on and hope that, you know, another day will people will forget. And, and people do have short memories. And this is why I wanted to just talk about this dictator, um, Monica, just for a moment, because this is a new thing where Donald Trump has actually taken the phrase dictatorship and dictator and starting to promote himself in that role. He posted a, a kind of cloud word image on Truth Social the other day that had dictator across it. And, you know, in interviews and in rallies, we're starting to see when he said, I'll be a you know day one dictator, dictator on day one, which of course is rubbish because he was already a dictator. And to those of us who know anything about history and the rise of fascism, to do the things that he did, like banning Muslims from entering the country, like disappearing people off the streets of Portland, like gassing American citizens who were peacefully protesting. These are the, the moves of a dictator. 
in an authoritarian regime. So to pretend that, oh, I might be in the future. I mean, I know it was Sean Hannity that posed the question and he was, you know, it was like an inside job. But just explain to us about Trump starting to own this. And what does he, you know, he obviously loves dictators, not just of history, but, you know, in current world politics. Talk to me about his psychological relationship with that role. Well, being a dictator, especially from a psychological point of view, is is a certain personality disposition, meaning um, it comes from developmental wounds. And uh, so it's not becoming a dictator that is a, a, a challenge for Donald Trump. It is uh, not being a dictator. Democracy is impossible for him because it would be intolerable. Um, he has to be set apart and set apart in the most extreme ways to overcompensate for his lack of uh, sense of self and um, his his deep seated feelings of uh, worthlessness and inadequacy, which is really what he's trying to compensate for by taking on the the biggest positions in the world, uh, uh, both the U.S. presidency and the one chosen by God. And um, so that's certainly been present from the very beginning and is often present uh, in dangerous individuals. In fact, they often seek power. Uh, what I've seen through my career is that uh, 25 years ago, when our democracy was stronger, such individuals were kept mostly in jails and prisons and society was protected from them. But then increasingly, they came to occupy roles in, um, in corporate boardrooms, in the judiciary, and now in among politicians and even the presidency. And so, um, so we're, we're seeing that shift. And Donald Trump does not just represent himself. He's not an isolated individual. The fact that he has gotten to this position is representative and, and indicative of the society's level of collective mental health. And this, again, is where uh, mental health knowledge is very helpful uh, in that where mental health principles apply. And, and when there's, there's impairment, uh, then uh, the, the individual or group or society becomes very predictable because uh, you become more rigid and unable to, uh, you're essentially uh, spiraling into uh, disorder uh, rather than being the flexible, uh, versatile, and resourceful uh, human being that uh, one is when when one is healthy, and that also applies to groups and nations. I've worked with street gangs, uh, prison blocks, where violent individuals take charge and uh, form their own cult-like unit, if you will. Uh, so, so what I'm what we're seeing in the public arena, uh, in the political arena, is not at all unfamiliar to me. It's, it's actually the exact dynamic that I've seen in my career working in jails and prisons. Um, and so the outcome of this is what's important to keep in mind, that it will continue along what I've been calling a death spiral, essentially because of a death drive that is behind all sickness, essentially um, the reason we distinguish disease from health is because it eventually leads to destructiveness against others and against oneself. Uh, that a nation that gets involved in this kind of uh, psychological pathology, and I've always said that fascism is not a uh, political ideology, but mental pathology and politics, once we fall into this spiral, then it will lead very rapidly toward our destruction. And we, won we may wonder, how can this happen to one of the most vibrant democracies in the world? 
Well, that's what pathology does. We see, we have seen even from COVID that those who contracted the illness, especially in the early stages, the down, uh, the downward spiral can be extremely rapid. Um, so depending on the disease and depending on the nature of the disease, we have to intervene in ways that we know how based on science, uh, public health measures when necessary, uh, our clinical experience. And this is what needed to be applied in the case of Donald Trump because of the severity of his symptoms and because of the public's unfamiliarity of, with the symptoms. I mean, normal human normalcy has a broad range and uh, we can deal with all kinds of diversity and uh, and get benefit from it. But uh, when things veer into the dom domain of pathology uh, and, and medical professionals will be able to identify um, features much better than the average person because sometimes patterns are not that obvious or the salient features will not be so um, so glaring to the untrained eye. Uh, it was critical for society to hear from mental health experts. In fact, I don't believe that there is a perspective that could replace ours. Uh, mental health expertise is critical uh, to public discussion. Of course, we, we shouldn't be the only voice. Uh, we are not used to uh, intervening at, a, at this kind of, especially at a political level. Uh, we certainly do uh, at a policy level or uh, at a societal level, and I've done that throughout my career. But uh, this particular case, uh, all the more so, required uh, mental health experts to be at the table with politicians, political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, economists, as we do at, um, at other settings. This is what happens all the time at the World Health Organization, at the uh, old Institute of Medicine that I was uh, a part of, which has now become the National Academies. And um, that this has not occurred, that mental health experts were the only experts that were excluded. And I would say because, precisely because, we were the most important voice, because the issue at hand had most to do with mental health expertise. That, uh, that the APA, having done this, having silenced us in uh, public discourse, uh, blacked us out of all the media, all the major media, has had, predictably, a detrimental effect to the to the point of uh, we could attribute we could attribute the 1.2 million American deaths from COVID. We could attribute the January 6 insurrection against the U.S. Capitol. Uh, we could attribute even the wars. I would attribute to the lack of intervention during the Trump years, uh, and certainly the the civil strife that is happening in our country, the polarization that the uh, institutional dysfunction uh, and breakdown that we're seeing in all domains has very much to do with having allowed pathology to reign as normal, not only throughout the Trump presidency, but even afterwards. I stated in my second book, The Profile, Profile of a Nation, Trump's Mind, America's Soul, that the Trump presidency would not end unless there were a proper intervention. And by that, I meant a psychologically informed one and an adequate one, not just an election. And in effect, that is what I see, that the Trump presidency never ended, which is why he is the number one candidate. And so many of his followers cannot see anyone else taking the presidency. Yeah. I, I, I keep saying that the insurrection is still going on. And, and, you know, that's certainly how it feels to me. And I think any, any of us who are, you know, anyone who, any of us who've been in therapy or who speak the language of mental health 
have a slightly different perspective because it's not black and white. There is a, there is a, a level of nuance that needs to be understood in order to be able to have a, a discourse on this, on this subject. And, and a lot of people just, including some members of my own family, won't even go there. Okay, we have to take a quick pause for our sponsor, but I, I want to come back and, and talk about Donald Trump's reaction to the death of his sister, which seems to not even register on, on his face other than a, a, a brief uh, you know, moment in front of the cameras. Um, but also Trump contagion, which you've described before, which is how his pathology seems to have now, like a, an epidemic, kind of infiltrated half of the nation and, and how we can take steps to change that. So we'll come back and talk to Dr. Bandy Lee after this here on The Weekend Show. I've always found it difficult to find clothes that I like to wear. And when I find one thing that works, I just buy loads of them and just wear the same thing all the time. Well, men's closets were due for a radical reinvention, and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion. The commuter collection offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, zips, and polos. You'll never have to worry about what to wear when you've got the Roan commuter collection. The comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work or your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And with Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. I personally love a technical fabric, something that is advanced and uses technology to make a more comfortable and more modern outfit. Now, the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So head to roan.com slash Anthony and use promo code Anthony to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash Anthony and use code Anthony A N T H O N Y. It's time to find your corner office comfort. Ten seconds on the clock. How many things can you name that are always growing? Your relationships, your skills, your customer base. How about businesses on Shopify? When we started podcasting, an online store was the furthest thing from our minds. Now we're selling T-shirts and Midas Touch merch. And it's so easy, all because we use Shopify. <coughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch of your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're delivering daily digests or serving sensational scoops, Shopify will help you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point-of-sale system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., and Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds and Rothneys and Brooklinen and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success at every step of the way, because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash weekend. Go to shopify.com slash weekend now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash weekend. We're back with Dr. Bandy Lee on The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. Um, the, the death of Trump's sister, she was a judge and, you know, he kind of spoke very briefly about it, but there didn't seem to really be a change to his schedule in any way. 
And it almost seemed like a sign of weakness that he would ever devote any time to kind of talking about how he might feel about it or, or, or anything really. And, and it's ironic that she was a, a kind of respected judge anyway, considering his position up in front of judges. Uh, we kind of know that she was certainly, you know, disappointed with how her brother had, you know, behaved and, and his relationship with the judiciary. I mean, is it the case that people like him, the, the malignant narcissist, they simply don't have time for stuff like that? Because famously, he didn't even go to his own brother's funeral years ago and went to the cinema instead. Yes, I think all the more so that she was an, a respected judge and someone who had some principles and standards that would make Donald Trump wish to negate her in his life. Yeah. Of course, we also know that she did his homework for him for years when he was uh, attending Fordham. And uh, she also commented that uh, something to the effect of uh, there, there are few people as immoral and as ignorant as he. And I'm sure those uh, comments becoming public uh, also led him to um, uh, wish to suppress memories of her in his life. But we also know that he goes far beyond uh, pathological narcissism. He would go uh, as far as to lacking any conscience or compassion or any human emotion other than anger and revenge. Uh, those are the kinds of, that's the level of extremity he exhibits. And uh, for such a person, um, it's human loss and death that he would wish to avoid, not his attachment to uh, any siblings or family members, which he probably does not have. We occasionally hear about the other Donald Trump the behind-the-scenes Donald Trump, who's not on camera, the guy who throws the ketchup at the wall and is swearing all the time and is in a kind of constant state of, of, of dissatisfaction and, and anger. You know, how does he suppress that when he's in front of the camera? Is it because he's like the eternal showman and he's just obsessed with image? What does that kind of other Donald Trump tell you about who this guy is? Well, he knows he's in charge, and he knows he's there with his acolytes. If he were in a room with a bunch of Trump haters or Democrats or uh, mental health professionals, he would probably not be that way. Um, Adolf Hitler was called a seismograph of crowds, uh, meaning that he was able to sense the crowds and uh, and essentially control it from afar. Um, he would gauge and measure their responses and, and uh, simply play them like an instrument. Uh, Donald Trump has that so-called talent. It's not really a talent, it's a survival skill that he has developed his entire life because he has no other basis. Uh, he lacks a kind of empathy and um, grounding in human relationships that the rest of us do. So uh, everything has been predicated on manipulation and pretense. So he essentially cons everybody. And he knows that his followers from uh, seven, eight, nine years of conditioning are made into essentially his puppets. Um, that's kind of a harsh way to put it, but, uh, but it's an effect of Trump contagion that his, oh, it, when, when we think of emotional contagion, uh, that follows a different path than, than rational communication uh, or, or logic or facts or uh, anything of, um, of real consequence in a political stage, uh, but it tugs on their emotional strings. And uh, we don't think of mental symptoms as being contagious, 
But in fact, they're far more contagious than physical symptoms, one might say, because we don't require physical exposure for the symptoms to spread. And all psychiatric symptoms are by nature psychosocial. So there's a social component that ties with all of us. And uh, so the spread of symptoms can happen very easily. And as I told you earlier, that um, strategy might spread, but far more effective are symptoms, pathology. Uh, delusions spread much more quickly than rational persuasion. Violence proneness is uh, considered epidemic uh, when, when there's exposure. And that is because uh, it's, it's the same kind of contagion. And well, people at the rallies still think he's the president. They're so brainwashed now by the repetitive nature of the misinformation over, over years that they, there's absolutely no room to even be you know, brought back to reality. They're so far down the rabbit hole. And it's almost as if they have become his foot soldiers. Yes. And of the same mind as he, because that's essentially what we see in the spread of mental symptoms. It, when severe, it's called shared psychosis. Uh, shared psychosis can also be individual diagnoses as uh, shared psychotic disorder, it used to be called, or induced delusions, induced symptoms. But when it happens at a societal level, it's a phenomenon of shared psychosis where uh, it happens at different levels. Uh, there are people with the same pathology uh, to start with as Donald Trump who get, uh, who are acting synergistically or uh, others who are predisposed, uh, but activated with his appearance and exposure to him. And there are those who were previously healthy and come to take on his symptoms, including delusions, paranoia, violence, proneness, all that uh, may be induced in people with, without prior symptoms. And there's a fourth group that may resist for a very long time, but then eventually succumb because of the pressures. And that's the hardest group to reverse. But what we know from shared psychosis is that once we remove the offending agent, which is the individual, primary individual with the symptoms, uh, then the others return to their original state. And this is what we see. Uh, I've seen it a great deal because I've worked in state hospital settings or prison settings where individuals go on for a long time without being treated. And um, especially in gangs or prison blocks, individuals may be revered for their pathological symptoms. And so, uh, so someone with authority can certainly convert uh, their followers into having the same disposition, the same beliefs, and if essentially, eventually, the same mindset and same symptoms. And what Donald Trump does is, is because part of his mind is uh, observing what is happening from the symptoms, it's not, it's not a conscious strategy. He looks with, uh, at, he looks with wonder at what he's capable of doing. That's why he said, you know, it's marvelous. He could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and, and not lose any voters. Yeah. Well, he's probably marveling now that he could kill off a million people and still not lose any voters. Right. And, uh, and so he sees this as his, well, his strength, uh, and, the means by which he can avoid prosecution, avoid uh, being held accountable, avoid facing his inadequacies, certainly avoid being called out for his mental defects, and seizing the presidency. That's why he hasn't appeared in any of the, uh, the debates, the debates yeah. because then his mental compromise will be stark for people to see. But he knows he won't lose any voters, but merely uh, set a new standard for being a presidential candidate. It's so interesting that what you say about all of the analysis that the media and you know public discourse has 
you know, Trump lovers, Trump haters, that actually there is a clinical explanation for all of it. And that, you know, without the kind of clinical involvement, people have just been fighting it out, you know, on social media and everywhere else. And of course, we shouldn't fail to mention the rise of social media and the timing of Donald Trump's rise as well. And even Elon Musk taking ownership of the public square, you know, the town square in, in Twitter and overpaying for it so he could manipulate the narrative. I mean, so much of this, it's like a perfect storm, isn't it? You know, it's like how we have life on Earth. You know, we, we need a sun, we need a moon, we need this solar system, which gives us life. And it's the same as the rise of Trump. Like, so many things had to happen. James Comey, you know, and his announcement about Hillary Clinton's emails you know, a few days before the vote. All of this, the, the, the perfect storm that enabled the rise of Donald Trump. And, and then we have Donald Trump winning, much to the surprise of most people in, in 2016, and saying that phrase, can you believe it? I'm the president. And when he said that, you know, not many people have really talked about that moment, but I've always found that really fascinating that he couldn't believe that he was the president. Mm -hmm. It was almost like he's grift. He's been grifting for years and somehow he managed to grift an entire nation into voting for him. Because of, for a very long time, he could not get his way in every domain. He was put in place by people who would refuse to put him in certain circles, refused to cover him the way that he wished. Despite his great coverage, uh, th there were limits. And uh, those limits started to chip away as our society became compromised uh, through its destructive socioeconomic policies, the, the escalating inequality, the corruption and authoritarianism that develops with inequality because economic inequality means that um, vast amounts of people are left uh, powerless and financially mm. incapacitated. The, the rampant capitalism, the, the, the wages not increasing, all of those things. Yes. So that has a mental health effect on society. And that's the increasing um, compromise and societal collective mental health that I had been observing for at least 25 years before Donald Trump came to power. And I, and, and you were correct to point out social media as well as Fox News. When Fox News first appeared, I was very concerned, even though I was just out of training in psychiatry, I knew enough to recognize that this kind of spewing of toxins in the air, uh, for people's minds is just like putting poison in the waters. People will grow increasingly sick and become incapable of defending their own health. Uh, their immune systems will become compromised. They, uh, they will um, catch all kinds of diseases and die from the poison in the water. Uh, the same holds true for uh, what we put into our minds. And so I was very concerned when Fox News uh, came about, and now it has proliferated into far more, uh, far more insidious uh, programs. And multiple networks as well. So I mean, yes, there are there are at least a, a dozen other networks that are parroting Fox News, and and it seems that what that does is it actually confirms the views of viewers because they'll see it on one channel. And then if they channel hop and then they hear it being said on another channel, to them they're actually, you know, they're cross-referencing or they're, they're doing, a, you know, an analysis and actually it is just more of the same, the, the, the echo chamber. And as we have seen from Alex Jones and other characters, that pathology has actually helped them to rise in stature because before there was a... There used to be standards with the news and uh, a requirement that one adheres to facts. And once those things are put in the same standing with mental pathology, as I said before, pathology would be far more aggressive in spreading 
and uh, and there would be no match. It is very much like saying somebody with COVID is uh, lying in bed and aching is simply leading a unique lifestyle and allowing them all kinds of contact with other people. Well, that lifestyle will spread very quickly, but it doesn't mean that it is uh, their choice. Uh, and leaving the population undefended by not giving them the ammunition, the, the defenses through knowledge and information left them uh, very vulnerable. And that, again, goes back to the intervention of the APA, stating that mental health experts should be the only ones not to comment in their area of expertise. Well, that occurred at a time when it was the most important voice to be heard. And this is the result. This, this, is, the this is the great failing of, of America in this moment, in this moment of history, is that, that the threat wasn't taken seriously, that experts were ridiculed in some cases. I mean, who would want to be Dr. Anthony Fauci ever again? I mean, that was just a, a tragedy of how someone who t devoted their life to public health became an enemy of, of the state in, in, in terms of the, the minds of, of half the voters. I want to talk about a poll just for a second. This came out a couple of days ago, a uh, Washington Post University of Maryland poll. They said 25% of Americans say it is probably or definitely true that the FBI instigated the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol, a false concept promoted by right-wing media repeatedly denied by federal law enforcement. Uh, the poll finds a smaller 11% of public overall thinks that there is solid evidence that FBI operatives organize and encourage the attack. 13% say this is their suspicion only. Among Republicans, 34% say the FBI organized and encouraged the insurrection compared with 30% of independents and 13% of Democrats. I mean, this is the Trump contagion that you describe, where people's minds, they don't know which way is up. They can't see reality from fantasy. It, you know, we watched it on t television, right? It was live. It was a live streamed event. Even Donald Trump watched it on television, did nothing about it, as we know. How do we get to a point that three years after the January 6th insurrection, that these types of numbers, despite the January 6th investigation, which was televised, despite all of the cases, despite the number of people that have admitted, you know, people that were up in front of judges that have admitted that they broke the law and, you know, were 1,230 people charged with federal crimes in the riot. Uh, sorting police officers, seditious conspiracy, 730 of them pleaded guilty to the charges. 170 have been convicted of, of at least one charge in a trial by judge or jury. And yet, these numbers in this poll suggesting that people still don't get it. It would be incorrect to fault the people for not getting it. This is, as you say, a natural consequence of the Trump contagion. Uh, Donald Trump had one goal, which was to elevate himself and buttress himself through the use of every institution, every individual, uh, the entire nation. There is not enough in the world to buttress his own self, uh, sense of self. Um, and nothing he would not sacrifice to that end. And so by continuing to have the public exposed to him, he was able to uh, manipulate their minds in ways that they would become further and further detached from reality, uh, be unable, uh, insulated from facts and evidence, and he changed even their modes of thinking and reasoning so that they would be impermeable to rational argument. Uh, and he said even at one point, don't believe what you hear or what you see, simply believe what I say. So this is a natural consequence of continued prolonged, prolonged exposure to someone with severely impaired um, 
uh, psychology. And it's a real tragedy because the FBI was such a revered institution. I've worked with FBI agents uh, on a number of cases uh, for, for criminal court. And, um, and even the FBI cannot withstand this kind of onslaught, which brings attention to the fact of how powerful mental symptoms can be. In fact, it's not so much that mental health is central and uh, such an important area that I've been highlighting it. Uh, in fact, mental health usually does not even come into discourse because it is so basic and uh, it is already taken care of in most settings. Uh, one is pre presumed mentally competent until doubts, uh, until signs of incompetence come up. And actually, uh, other than elected office, every single job uh, requires that you have competence. And so if there are any signs of incompetence, you would be removed from the job or any task until you can pass a test to, to show that you are fit. And that counts for any task, including signing a will. Uh, but the fact that elected office is the only office that we do not require fitness for uh, is a real anomaly. And it shows how much mental fitness is, uh, should be a requirement because it's basic for every task. And I'm sure that the that our founders, uh, the signers of the Constitution, did not intend that elected officials uh, do not have to meet the standard of mental fitness that every other citizen must. That they have, that they are the only ones with that privilege. Uh, I don't think that is what they intended. Well. When we look at video of life in the 1970s, it looks so completely different to life now. You can only imagine what life was like in the 1800s and how they have no relation to, to, to life now. And, and, and that's why, you know, we are, we, we will, we will, it will take a lot to convince people that actually maybe the constitution is not correct on when it comes to these types of subjects and that and or that, a rigid document that does right, not the, the, evolve yeah. with the times it needs Taking to be amended to, to, to suit yeah is, it's very it's, interesting because there um, are there are vehement constitutionalists right there are people who just you know the way that they the way that they interpret it is very is very traditional and we've seen this even with the new house speaker who's a far-right christian nationalist uh, who, who Mike Johnson, who, who interprets the Bible literally. And, you know, he is somebody at the very center of government. He was somebody who was intrinsic in the January 6th insurrection. And now he's found himself elected and it's almost as bad. And I, I want to talk about the fact that what you said about how, if, if you get rid of Donald Trump, a lot of people will revert to their, you know, their, their pre, uh, brainwashed state. But there are other people involved too. I mean, there are people right. writing those Hitler quotes in Trump's speeches, putting it on the autocue for him to read. They're, they're not going to go away necessarily. There are people like Mike Johnson who are not going to go away. The, the, the Trump contagion has infected lawmakers at every level, including Mitch McConnell, who leads the Republicans in the Senate, who didn't ratify Trump's uh, impeachment for for the insurrection, and they all continue to speak the language of Donald Trump, whether it be on extreme things like uh, abortion or immigration, or their attitude towards the LGBTQ plus community. The damage has been done, hasn't it? So, just explain about defaulting back to pre-Trump life, and if that's possible when Trump is incarcerated or, or leaves the planet versus how he has now has surrogates who are continuing this cult of Trump. You're correct about surrogates, but I would caution that we are still not out of uh, Donald Trump's sphere of influence, that 
we have continued to allow his exposure through uh, social media and um, and the social media. media. Yes, uh, uh, Truth Social and Twitter that's been taken up by Elon Musk uh, specifically to allow this level of influence. And um, we would be surprised to see the effects of actually removing them, um, actually removing this exposure, because we have tried it once uh, shortly after the January 6th Capitol attack, uh, he was deplatformed from Facebook and Twitter at the time, and there was an immediate drop in support. In fact, there was an immediate uh, reversal among a lot of Republicans. Yeah, including um, Mitch McConnell. Yes. And, and then it recalibrated back. Why was that? It was because... Uh, the deep platforming did not entirely eliminate the exposure. Uh, so there's, there is that, uh, that one, uh, factor that we have not truly experienced removing him. Also, uh, uh, his losing the election. Many people say that his, uh, dealings of the COVID pandemic, his, gross mishandling of it uh, contributed to uh, his fall in popularity. I would say it was the the drop in exposure that uh, at that time there was um, uh, uh, there were social movements at that time, including the Black Lives Matter movement, that 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 kind of removal from a place of authority uh, has a great influence. That is where we should keep our focus. And if mental health experts ever have a chance to consult with uh, policymakers or decision makers, these are the aspects that we would highlight because there is there are many things we can do outside of traditional mental health intervention because uh, because we can gauge. Uh, the psychological effects of the psychological and cultural effects of uh, political interventions or uh, social media interventions, what have you. Donald Trump has been removed from the ballot in a couple of locations, Colorado and Maine. Um, there are other jurisdictions where people are putting cases forward, you know, under the 14th Amendment to take him off the ballot because he was involved in insurrection. He's now appealing these, obviously. And in the, you know, the case of the appeal, um, I think Trump's lawyers contended that in our system of government of the people, by the people and for the people, Colorado's ruling is not and cannot be correct, they said. The problem with this is that, you know, whilst many of us were celebrating Trump's removal from the ballot in a couple of districts, the, you know, the, the justice system doesn't seem to be able to keep any grip on Donald Trump. He seems to slip through the fingers of justice at, at every juncture. And, you know, this is going to keep happening because he kick, kicking it to the Supreme Court where there are three Trump loyalists who owe him a debt of gratitude in session, not to mention the fact that the court is stacked with, you know, far-right Republican extremist views, that really the system of justice is not designed to save the people from a tyrant such as Donald Trump. I would differ in that. Good. I have. <laughs> I need to hear. It. I need to hear it praised. for my own sanity. Uh, I have enthusiastically praised uh, the 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 attention given to for the Fourteenth Amendment, Section Three, uh, precisely because of its psychological effects. It may not be the legal system that can save us. It may not be uh, the Supreme Court Court's job to intervene in this way. But it is all our responsibility to contain the psychological uh, effects of 
Donald Trump, be it to his followers, uh, toward himself, the kind of limit setting and containment that is necessary and the reestablishment of standards and norms and, uh, and normality comes from advocating through every avenue, however we can, because he's had a widespread influence that has changed the culture itself. So we all have to be collaborative in this, in that um, it was important to push the, the disqualification clause, uh, not just through the, the Supreme, the Colorado Supreme Court, but also through uh, rhetoric lectures, um, the, the uh, other elected officials who have the capacity to carry out disqualification, it's been said, is, is self-executing. It does not require court ruling to carry out, although court rulings can add to it. Uh, it is the same as uh, mental impairment. If one is mentally unfit for the job, it should be self-disqualifying. In other words, um, people should not uh, be forced to uh, have someone who is unfit to do the job. The, the purpose of having the job in the first place, having the presidency in the first place, is so that someone would carry out the duties of the presidency. If one cannot do that, but rather brings destructiveness to the position and destructiveness to the nation, then that should be a disqualifier. And the lack of a mental health fitness test should not deter uh, our having that discussion. It, it, it's very interesting, isn't it? That it's almost like bringing these cases puts it front and center of the national conversation. That's right. And, and it means that we're actually talking about disqualification for the first time when we probably should have been talking about it when you started uh, blowing the whistle in the first place. Yes. Fin finally, um, Dr. Lee, the, the, the attempted coup on the 6th of January never ended, according to a watchdog report, uh, since the same Donald Trump allies behind the insurrection are now leading this sham impeachment effort against Joe Biden. Uh, it's a report produced by the Congressional Integrity Project, uh, marking three years since a mob of Trump supporters ransacked the U.S. Capitol in a bid to overturn the election defeat. Argues yes, that the Congress members themselves yes. have not been disqualified. Right, and and yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole list of people involved, and yet and yet you know the, the, it's the foot soldiers that are the ones that have been you know, at, at carrying the can for Donald Trump. But but this report argues that scores of Trump loyalists in the House of Representatives have continued to push the former president's election lies, and they're ready to go further in a bid to, to put him back in the White House. So just finally, I, I just want to be very clear about what you say of like removing Donald Trump. Will it mean that these individuals who are so far gone, but also have their own agenda? Because I'm sure you've read Project 2025, which is nearly a thousand pages of this far-right Christian nationalist manifesto for, for you know, a, a future Republican president in in this year's election. I mean, it, it doesn't mention Donald Trump necessarily. You know, it, it it has a plan for rewinding the U.S. back 50 or 60 years, where you can't marry who you want to marry. You, you women don't have access to the health care that they that they need. And, and where LGBTQ plus people are basically removed from society. I mean, that, that would still happen even without Trump. Or are you saying that that document would, would become null and void? Well, r removing just Trump will not change the cultural changes that he has effectuated and his uh, emboldening of this kind of psychology, which is actually the psychology I see in violent perpetrators. The goal is violence and domination. And certainly with the removal and holding to account Donald Trump, which is first and foremost, but also his co-conspirators 
and not allowing, taking preventive measures so that similar individuals cannot arise because we will be in a very vulnerable period where people are conditioned to submit to a leader and to follow a leader. So uh, we have to take multiple preventive measures as well. Uh, what I was speaking about was uh, that removal of Donald Trump and removal of his authority will be significant for the cultural recalibration that allows in setting back some standards and norms and safeguards that violence, threats, and intimidation will not be the rule of the day. And uh, all the policies are like that. Um, Pro-life policy is about femicide, not about protecting the fetus. Um, and Control, really, isn't it? And then, and yes. that's the—that's really the tragedy of this, because you know, I, I do believe that the U.S. is a very um, progressive country as a whole, and 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 very thoughtful, and has a great sense of humanity. And humanity really is the word that's missing from anything Trump-related. And and I I I really believe I have quite an, an optimistic outlook on on the election this coming year because America did not vote for Donald Trump last time. The midterms, all of the Donald Trump candidates in the main failed to you know all the candidates that he endorsed they failed to win the seats that they they were seeking. I do think that the conscience, the social conscience, especially surrounding a woman's right to choose, will win out. And the, and, the, and the only concern, I suppose, is that what Donald Trump will say is, if he loses, that it was rigged, that you know it wasn't a fair election, and the cycle will continue, or will he eventually skulk back into the shadows? You know, at what point does this does this noise stop? That's why we have to place limits. The only, uh, well, the first treatment that we have to institute with some, such individuals is behavioral management, which is setting limits and containment. And uh, our nation has been continually afraid to do so because every time we try to institute a measure, he hits back with threats. Um, he calls on his followers to, to threaten and uh, become violent. Well, look what happened with the U.S. Capitol attack. Uh, if we don't uh, severely execute the, the standards that we do have, be they legal, criminal, uh, mental health, all of these measures need to be carried out with conviction and uh, and steadfast um, adherence and belief because we are dealing with a violent and aggressive individual, not continually pull back and be lighter on him because he will be threatening or not carry out uh, the normal legal procedures because we're afraid of the repercussions or afraid of civil war. I've said repeatedly that uh, the dangers are great either way, but the dangers will be far greater if we appease him. And the sooner we act and the more decisively we act, and now we have to act against him as well as multiple co-conspirators, as, as you pointed out, but, but this is simply the application of normal law normal criminal law, constitutional law, and normal standards of mental capacity and fitness would go a long way in, in eliminating this uh, perilous situation we've been in uh, without end since, since his appearance in the political arena. Okay. We have to finish, but I, I, I'm so thrilled. I mean, you, you really are brilliant. And I, I'm so grateful to you for your crusade and for your ability to keep sounding the alarm despite everything you have faced. So thank you, Dr. Bandy Lee, for joining us on The Weekend Show. Thank you very much for having me.
You can find out more about Bandy Lee's work at bandylee.com. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. And the five minute news podcast. You can hear me tell you what's going on around the world while you make a morning coffee. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news stories to discuss on the five minute news weekend show with Midas Touch. <laughs>